Welcome to the Emerald City Hockey Podcast. Join RJ and Dylan as they discuss each week's Seattle Kraken news and top stories from around the league. All right, RJ, I'm going to kick off the podcast with some bad news, good news this week. All right. Late right. on me. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go first because I got all the bad news. Okay, um, oh, fair enough. It fits with my pessimistic personality, though. It's fine. Um, I mean, first bad news, getting crushed in fantasy this week. After crushing you last week, I'm getting crushed this week. Uh, that sucks. Oh, well. Uh, second piece of bad news. Due to all the weather, not just up there in Seattle, wonderful for you guys that you got snow. Very happy for you. Looks amazing. Looks like so much fun. And I'm not being like sarcastic here. I genuinely mean it looks like a lot of fun. (laughs) Uh, Definitely feel like I'm missing out. The storms are just going to keep coming. There is no way for us to drive up there. So at least for now, the trip is canceled. So I will not be coming up to see you and potentially everybody else, um, you know, this week <laughs> it's just not happening so uh no no trip that's that's all that's all the news i have it's all bad news not fun you on the other hand got some good news especially today yes um you know this is that's the flip side of the snow and everything that we got and of you know of course i'm i'm disappointed as i'm sure a lot of our listeners are you know that uh, you won't be able to make the trip up but on the good side of the snow i mean how how fun was it getting few inches of snow in the city that was great um and i want to give a huge shout out uh to our wonderful patron cole uh who offered me uh some seahawks tickets uh for the game today that uh you know he, he wasn't using and i got to go bring my girlfriend it was a fantastic experience and uh go to one of only three snow games that they have ever had uh at lumen field for the seahawks uh just an awesome game to go to and, and great to sit and watch the game with you too. Uh, so big shout out to Cole. Thank you for that. Um, and it was a fun experience. Uh, and uh, also driving in the snow there and back was, was quite interesting as well. Uh, a little dodgy, but uh, got there and back just fine. Yeah. Mostly back. <laughs> yeah. Mostly. That was, <laughs> that was the tricky part. Um, but uh, this, this Southern California native, got through his first time driving the snow all right yeah so that is what important everybody made it in one piece it's, it's a good thing um so obviously no cracking hockey to really talk about from this past week um everybody's going to be listening to this on you know monday the 27th we were supposed to be doing live commentary that game was postponed against vancouver we had other fun stuff potentially lined up for that we were maybe gonna talk with um lachlan again uh to talk about the canucks talk about you know how things have changed under boudreau kind of give like a primer for that game on this podcast not happening now we have no idea when this game is going to be played or anything um it's our fault for preparing so thoroughly yeah we're gonna have a guest on we're gonna do the live stream all that i know That's, that's really on us i think yeah i mean we never prepare this is what happens when you prepare clearly is everything goes crazy Take um, the lesson, kids. Never prepare. It, exactly. You know, we really were trying because we knew this last week, nothing going on. Ugh. Oh, well. Um, so I guess we'll start with the news that we do have. A uh, little bit of like injury news and, uh, and of course, COVID updates. And then we can yes. like touch on maybe one or two things and then we'll just get into the mailbag for this week. And, you know, we'll see how long this podcast turns out because um, it's just just been a, a rough time for 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 news and and everything. Yeah, I mean it's you know we we figured we'd get some more news with today's practice, uh, and we did. It was a very kind of shorthanded, Kraken roster that that was on the ice for practice today, uh, and there were some real worries, especially given that they were missing you know five regulars that were new. Uh, we're like that's. That's not good. Uh, it was Will Borgen, Colin Blackwell, Jordan Eberle, Vince Dunn, and Ryan Donato. Those are some very important players there missing. Yes. Uh, but thankfully, three of them, uh, Borgen, Blackwell, and Eberle, were absent from practice due to snow caused travel delays. Can totally understand that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, thankfully, that's all it was that was keeping them from practice. Unfortunately, Ryan Donato and Vince Dunn have both been added to COVID protocol for the Kraken. Uh, so they joined Jamie Alexiak, Adam Larson, and Carson Soucy in protocol. 
So that means the Kraken have five players currently in COVID protocol, four of whom are defensemen. So Kraken looking really thin on the blue line right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I know Kraken are not the only team still going through this. Uh, obviously, the NHL pushed stuff back through, you know, Monday, uh, hoping, I guess, everything would be fine after that. But, I mean, we, all of us who have been... I don't know what been, else expected, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, all of us who have lived through the last, you know, two years now, that that's not how this works, unfortunately. These don't come and go in a week's time. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, what's going to happen with the crack and what's going to happen with their, you know, upcoming opponents, all of that. I know, you know, several teams today as, as players were showing back up to practice, we're having, you know, large numbers go into COVID protocol, people testing positive and stuff. So it's going to be interesting to see when we really get back to hockey right now. It's, yeah. it's the flyers game, right? I think so. That's yeah. I think that's the next one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Who knows what exactly the Kraken roster will look like. Also, Adding to that, can't forget, Brandon Tanev. Mm-hmm. And we've kind of been waiting on an update on him for a while. He had that lower body injury in the Kraken's last game. Looked pretty bad. Sources out of the team say, you know, it is pretty bad. He'll be out indefinitely. Uh, today, checking the NHL media site, the Kraken have placed him on injured reserve. So he will he will be out at least a little while. Although we didn't really get any more of an update than that. The team... Crack and PR said that there was no update beyond that uh, and that hopefully they will have one tomorrow. Again, not a good sign. You know, when no. you're waiting this long and over the break and still don't have a solid update, that's never good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, we'll wait to see exactly what it is for him, but don't expect Brandon Tanev back in the lineup anytime soon. No, I mean, this is the one time you want a upper or lower body injury designation because at least like, okay, it's something. Like, well, I believe they've said lower body. Okay, yeah, that's what I had thought in the past, and that's what it, you know, certainly seemed like before. Right. But uh, watching the video, it's clear. Yeah. yeah, I saw something earlier that was just injury, and I was like, okay, <laughs> like <laughs> other people had designations. This was just injury. I was like, well, okay, that's not good. <laughs> no, <laughs> just whole body injury. Okay, um, yeah, no, that's it's. it's it's very it's upsetting on multiple levels right like it's upsetting from like a play standpoint Kraken are definitely going to miss him and his energy and the you know stuff he brings on like the pk and all of that uh gonna miss just his personality seeing him out there in warm-ups right skating around no bucket mm-hmm. the hair oh my gosh we're gonna miss that and and uh all of that so it, it is rough uh rough indeed but uh that's i mean that's that's like it <laughs> pretty much yeah the I mean, news. We'll, we'll... Woo. <laughs> yep we'll wait to see who else is on covid protocol tomorrow's practice and uh we'll update you from there yeah so um i guess not not too much other stuff to talk about obviously because the you know the whole nhl has basically been out of it for a little while world juniors start today as of, you know recording on the 26th mm-hmm. podcast obviously comes out uh tomorrow morning for us um that's exciting Kraken of multiple prospects in that going to do our best to, to try to track it and follow it and, and give like good information, kind of scouting reports through it. Um, neither of us has access to NHL network where all these games are on. So make things a little difficult. It's going to make things a little difficult. Yes. Uh, but we're going to do our best, obviously still excited for it. It's, it's, you know, one of the highlights of the year hockey wise, at least for me for a long oh, for time. Sure. So excited for it and excited you know, to be covering a team now and, and, you know, being able to talk about the prospects that they have going on. Uh, but again, as of right now, like n- nothing for us. So <laughs> there's nothing to talk about other than it's starting. So that's fun. Uh, we can talk, I guess, briefly about the IIHF's decision to you know, like cancel the women's tournaments next month, but keep yeah. the men's tournament this week, yeah. which universally has been, you know, slammed rightfully. So it makes it really makes no sense. Maybe it makes financial sense. That could be the only thing. But again, it's like you're going to say, oh, the women's tournament doesn't make as much money. Well, it's because you keep canceling it every year and you don't like, you know, you have to promote it. It has to be played if you want eyeballs on it. We are seeing women's hockey and really women's sports in general growing across the board everywhere. So you got to think if this tournament was played, numbers would increase. All that stuff would be good, especially after not having it last year. 
Yeah, and certainly, gosh, given all the limited resources that they used to dealing with, I was seeing you know, even in the 2019 tournament, they were reusing the men's tournament lanyards. They had mm-hmm. the same men's tournament ads, like they had to change. Yeah, so it's it really needs to stop just being an afterthought. Uh, but I thankfully, yeah, you know, I think people have you know made it known and and you know have spoken up, and hopefully that will uh, lead the IHF to to take some better actions and, and hopefully remedy this. Yeah, and uh, it's just. Certainly, certainly the reasoning they gave of just, you know, oh, it's, just, it's probably just not safe right now to, to do something like that as you're, you know, days away from starting the, you know, the tournament that's going to have more people around <laughs> in general and everything. It's like, yeah, OK, uh, I believe you. Um, but again, even that, that's that's kind of it. Like That was really the big story from the past week around hockey. So, RJ, let's just get into the mailbag and uh, see what... Uh, what people are asking yes and uh i want to thank everyone for who submitted questions for the mailbag we love hearing your questions we we love going through them uh and certainly on on times like this it gives us some fun stuff to talk about um so we'll go with kind of the easiest uh segue right into that you know talking about the break uh and uh this question is can you see the pause working in the kraken's favor maybe working as a mental reset for the rest of the season yeah i mean it's it's hard not to think that it's going to be a good thing for them, right? It, yep. It's one of those when you're at the bottom, like, and there's nowhere to go but up. Like, it, it can't hurt. It can't make any things worse, that's for sure. But we've been talking for a while about, cer- you know, certain guys, especially with Grubauer, get him get him some time. Uh, Drieger been hurt most of the year. Grubauer's starting a lot of games. Uh, anything to get kind of get him out, let him mentally reset. Goalies need that from time to time. That's just the way it is. And so, you know, yes, Drieger was just starting to come back, but I think that this extended break, it's got to be helping Grubauer out. Uh, I can only see positives coming from that. For sure. And goaltending is certainly the area where they need most, the most of a reset. You talked about, we were doing the Kraken Christmas wish list, you know, and Grubauer just needs a hard reset. Uh, Mm -hmm. And if anything can kind of help give it to him, I think it's this break. And you look at guys that, you know, maybe with a break like this, you have some hot streaks interrupted, you know, things like that. But just given the way the team was trending, I think it's probably pretty well timed for the Kraken. Yeah. And again, kind of like what we talked about back during the, you know, the the, the original big losing streak, um, just taking some time, being able to, you know, the coaching staff can implement things right? It's, it's hard as you're going, you know, every other night you're playing a game, you're traveling, all that stuff. It's, it's hard to be able to really sit there, have your video coaches go over stuff with the players, try to tweak the system, implement that system, make it muscle memory with everybody. Like that stuff is just hard to do mid season. Um, and so anytime you get an extended break off between games, uh, I know, you know, maybe practices haven't been happening super regularly just because of the state of everything. Um, but I got to think that, you know, behind the scenes, guys are watching film. Coaches are still communicating with the players about things. You know what I mean? Like all of that stuff's happening. And we saw, you know, all the good it did last time. I got to think that that also is going to help. You know, anytime you got the time to communicate and work on things like that, it's it's helpful. For sure. The coaching staff talks a bunch about it, how useful it is to just get some kind of days with practice in, with film in. I think you see it with them going right back to practice today, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where they didn't have to do that. They go right back to practice today. They got practice scheduled for noon tomorrow um, and just kind of getting those multiple days in and and really looking to, you know, get started for the rest of the season on the right foot. Mm -hmm. Um, Cool. So that question, oh, by the way, that question was from Aaron Wilson. Thank you, Aaron, for that question. Uh, Moving on to the next question, and we're going to kind of lump a few of these together because we have some questions that are pretty similar to each other. Uh, you know, we can talk about a similar thing. So uh, we've got Robert Wilson uh, and saying real solid mascot predictions from both of you. And Tony, where's the mascot? What's the story? So yeah, I mean, you're the you're the one to ask about the story. What's the story, RJ? Well, as far as the story, um, I mean, I had been following these little kind of pieces that looked like ice shards and you know mm-hmm. like that that had been down in the at the event level of the arena since opening night and i just kept well, you know what is this going to be for what's this going to be for uh and then finally during last game they were up in the rafter you know up uh yeah in the rigging in the rafters mm-hmm. uh and it was a 
assembled. It was a tentacle with some ice shards coming out of it. I thought they might lower it to use it for that game, but they didn't. I think we'll probably see that soon. I don't know why they'd put that up there if it wasn't uh, going to be used soon. So that's not the mascot, but maybe it provides some kind of clue. I don't know. The other portion of it is they have these NFT, you know, their NFT drop that mm -hmm. um, they were going to do a mascot preview uh, on some of them. As far as I can tell, those ones haven't really sold all that well. So <laughs> I'm not aware of, of anyone in particular that owns one of those. So as far as the hints and everything, I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of that before the mascot is revealed. Uh, they did seem to show on the graphic for the nft though some kind of deep sea diver it looked like mm -hmm. yeah uh, which maybe that's a hint at what it is mm -hmm. i think that's probably the best yes it'd have to be the odds on favorite right now as far as what the mascot's gonna be yeah and and that's what i would go with like having to give a guess that's you know what i have um we kind of talked about that last time we talked about the mascot situation right we we talked about how that would kind of be you know, it's something that makes sense, right? Where's the Kraken? They've been pushing the idea of the deep, all that stuff. Um, the way they're using all the projections and boards around Climate Pedge Arena just to make you feel like you're underwater and all of that. Like, it, it makes sense to have some form of deep sea diver or a uh, character related to that. So um, that's, yeah, I, I think to me that's, that's what's happening. It'll be interesting, though, um, yeah, how they work in, like, the tentacle and stuff for you know, pregame warmups, however they're going to do it. Uh, you know, have the, having the team skate onto the ice around it, I guess. I was say, there's no, yeah, you can't it's, go it's through like it. Tunnel tape like the other, there's no clear place to go through it. Uh, maybe going around it though. Yeah. And you know, I thought, well, maybe they're doing something cool where they could lower it, but keep it shadowed and be projecting something on the other half of the ice. And then maybe someone, you know, raises up the Kraken Right. They release the Kraken mm -hmm. and then like you get like some sound effect and maybe a, a big light flare and then boom, there's like this tentacle coming up out of the ice or something that could be cool. Maybe they'll do something like that. Um, but I don't know that a deep sea diver would do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know uh, about that. We'll see. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what they do. Yeah, mm -hmm. Johnny Greco and, and uh, Lamont Buford, they've they've got some cool ideas. They're definitely yep. capable of doing some creative things. I'm excited to see what they have up their sleeve. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that that question. Uh, next, uh, a couple similar questions here. We've got uh, Jared Rusnak. If you were both to play GM for a day, what trades would you make for the Kraken? And then Robert Wilson, if you're Ron Francis, who gets re-signed uh, during or after this season? So start first things first. We're Ron Francis for a day. What All are right. we doing? Is the day today because it's the roster freeze? I <laughs> yes. think we're still in the roster freeze. I think we're just hanging out in his office. Yeah, well, that makes things pretty easy then. Uh, we're watching practice. That's what we're doing. We're leaning against that wall that he leans up against, and uh, yep. we're watching like practice. That wall. Yeah, and we're talking. We got our people. phone on speaker. Exactly, we're like talking to people on speakerphone. Um, all right. So assuming it's tomorrow, <laughs> and, yeah, and we can do things. Um, I guess maybe in tandem, kind of taking the questions as far as like trades and things we've talked several times now about, you know, certainly given where the team's at standing wise and the way they're trending, the way they've been playing, it makes sense only to, to kind of sell off for, for draft picks and stuff, try to fill out the prospect pool at this, at this point. Um, not too many guys that I'd want to just totally give up on though. Uh, we've talked several times about Mark Giordano. Still think that's the most obvious move to make. Uh, it helps kind of ease up the the defenseman log jam that you have as well. Um, someone else that I'd throw in there just because, you know, looking ahead as far as like re-signings or anything, Callie Yarncroak. We've mm -hmm. talked, doesn't really quite seem like he's fitting in on this Kraken team all that much. He hasn't been producing a lot for them. Um, and he's, you know, an unrestricted free agent at the end of this year. So, you know, probably not going to look at re-signing him. So you might as well get something from him from a team that maybe feels like he can come in and help them, you know, for a playoff push. Yep. Yarn Croak was the name I was going to add. Giordano is the name that kind of everyone's been talking about. Yarn Croak is another one. And really when you're looking at kind of trades to be made between now and the trade deadline, you essentially just have to look at, okay, which guys are UFAs? Which guys are you going to mm -hmm. lose for nothing, possibly, if you let that go? And so you've got Giordano, you've got Yarncroak. Um, 
you know, Marcus Johansson is another one, although I would I would hang on to him. I just think he yeah. brings so much to the team and Me considering too. what you can get for him, just not worth it. Uh, other UFAs, maybe Colin Blackwell, as much as I like him, it seems like the Kraken haven't really given him the role that you need to give him to get the best out of him. Uh, they, you know, he's still one of the lowest guys as far as time on ice. You know, maybe that part of that's just working back from injury and COVID and all that, but uh, he's another guy they're going to have to make a decision on. Yeah, I was going to say, part of it's just he can't catch a break so far this season. Yeah. Um, but I agree. I mean, he was the other guy we talked about alongside Yarn Croak as far as where's the fit? Like, like what is what is his role on this team? Doesn't feel like he has one. And, and it just, the production it, that, you know, was expected just isn't there. And uh, so, yeah, I, I could see moving on from Blackwell, too. Because, again, yeah, you might as well get something for these guys. And they're good yeah. players too. Like, like not just like, oh, let's just dump them all for seventh round picks and move on. Like, I think you could actually get something halfway decent for Yarn Croak or Blackwell at a trade deadline from a playoff team. For sure. I mean, th- what they could do for in the right role for a playoff mm-hmm. team, you know, very valuable. Yeah. Um, all right. Next. Um, so uh, we've got Chris. Uh, hey, dudes. Was wondering if you could do a deeper dive on cap space as in how it could play out for the team come the March trade deadline. And I guess we'll combine this also with Striatic. What is the purpose of hanging on to so much unused cap space this season? And what is the plan for it going forward? Could the Kraken have better used their cap space advantage dur- during free agency in the expansion draft to have had a more successful debut season while avoiding long-term cap issues? Um, so I guess real quick, let's cover trade deadline cap space. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause that's coming up. We were just kind of talking about the trade deadline. Um, as far as surplus cap space during the trade deadline, unless you're going out and trying to acquire a big ticket, there's not a whole lot you can do with it. The one thing you can do, and we saw this a little bit last season, mm-hmm. is you can more or less sell that cap space being a third party to a team that can use uh, that space. Um, so sometimes there'll be teams that are really up against the cap. They don't have enough cap room for the rest of the season to bring on a big ticket uh, rental that they're trying to get. So sometimes a third party team will be involved. The player will go from the first team to the second team, retain 50%. Second team, the intermediary team, would also then retain 50%, making it cheaper uh, for that third ultimately acquiring team. I believe the Sharks were involved in one of those uh, last trade deadline on, I believe it was Matthias Janmark going to the Golden Knights because mm-hmm. Vegas was right up against the cap. Yeah. Couldn't afford Janmark's whole ticket. So the Sharks went and retained some salary and got a draft pick to do so. I think it was only a later round pick. Maybe it was a fifth or if it was fourth, fifth, something like that. Um, so that's, that's really the only thing the Kraken could do with their cap space uh, over the trade deadline. Um, and, don't expect a huge return if they do that, because generally there are a few teams out there that are all willing to. So it kind of drives the price down. Yeah. And, and that's something, you know, it's been around in like the NBA for a really, really long time. The idea of doing this. And I was happy to see it happen last year. Um, Obviously the flat cap has created this market um, before, I guess just no one had the idea to do it. I don't, or, or it wasn't as big a deal. It wasn't worth it to teams to do. Um, but yes, that's that's the way you you know weaponize your cap space come trade deadline time. But as you said, returns right now, while that market figures itself out, it's still in its infancy, pretty low. Maybe, maybe you can find someone desperate, and I, I don't know. But like you said, there's other teams willing to do it too. So returns are low, but it's all better than nothing. Like you're you know you're getting exactly. it essentially for free. Do. Yeah, and that was something that was brought up last uh, last trade deadline too, where the Sharks essentially helped their biggest rival Vegas out making this mm-hmm. trade. And the Sharks GM Doug Wilson came out and said, like, "Hey, if we didn't do this, there were other teams just lined up down the block yeah. to do it." You know, Vegas was getting the player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we might as well benefit from it a little bit. Exactly. Um, so moving on to Stratic's question, I guess what is the purpose of hanging on to so much unused cap space this season? Plan for it going forward, and then something that I think we disagree on a little bit. Uh, you know, could the Kraken have better used that cap space, you know, in the off season when acquiring players through expansion and, and whatnot to, you know, take on guys that aren't necessarily longer term burdens, but still be better this year. Yeah. So I guess to start, I don't know that they could have, you know, that, that spending to the cap would have greatly changed things for this team already what's the number one problem this team has had all year from like a roster construction management problem it's too many players 
Yes. So spending more in free agency, not going to help that problem out at all. I don't know that it would help out the product on the ice all that much either. I mean, again, this team on paper should be better than it is already. Um, so it seems like that, you know, those issues are elsewhere. It's not in player composition, so to speak, or at least not as obviously. Um, so I don't know that they could have used it differently. Uh, in that sense, you and I are both in favor of having cap space available if when you need it. Like, I don't sure. think it's ever a bad thing to be sitting on $7 million in cap space. Like, it means you can acquire somebody. It means come next year's free agency, you don't have to try to maybe get rid of a different contract to bring somebody in. If, you know, a great player becomes available that you really think is going to help out your club. I, I'm in favor of it. I don't think they did anything wrong as far as not spending it in free agency or holding it on, holding on to it this whole time. And I, I assume you're in agreement on that. Yes, I think the cap space is certainly good to have going forward and something that, you know, you can kind of have in your back pocket and as opportunities present themselves, you can use it and be in a situation where other teams can't do certain things that you can do. Uh, the one exception, though, I, I do have, you know, to saying that they couldn't do a whole lot better was I think there were certain areas in the expansion draft uh, where they could have targeted a player or two that I think really would have helped uh, fix one of this team's main problems, and that is just scoring. Having some goal scorers, having guys who can break through. They only have a few of those guys. I think having another one or two would go a long way to making the team better. Mm -hmm. And there were those guys available. I think Max Domi uh, would mm -hmm. be the primary one, uh, you know, where he's had a really good season this season. He's almost a point-per-game player. I know there were some character concerns. There was also just some concerns about whether he would play or not. There were some injury things. So I get that. I understand the decision, you know, if you don't want to go with him for that reason. But at the end of the day, you have essentially a point-per-game player and the contract, the most important thing, the contract was just one year. It was just this season. So regardless, he's off the books at the end of this season. So it doesn't really cost you anything extra. You still have that flexibility going forward. It doesn't really hurt you. Whereas other guys like maybe a, a Vladimir Tarasenko, you know, is more of a risk or a James Van Riemsdyk. They did have two years left on the contract. So you weren't going to have that cap space in your pocket next off season. But Max Domi is the obvious one uh, that I see. Yeah. And, and I, I do agree with that uh, for, you know, the most part, I guess the one place I would disagree is like, how much the cap factored into it. Cause I just don't think that it did that much. That's true. I, and, Cause I think that wouldn't be what would have stopped them. I think if, yeah. they, if everything else was a go, I don't think they would have let that stop them. Right. So it was probably the other things. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I just think like the, the plan was a, you know, clearly multi-year plan mm -hmm. having Max Domi around for one year to maybe help out with scoring this season, not, maybe in in the cards again i don't really see anything wrong with it like go ahead and do it you have to take someone from columbus anyway you might as well take the best player even if you just flip them like mm -hmm. the next yeah, they day end up taking essentially no one yeah you know, and Gavin with her, so so that's the, that's the part i have the biggest problem with it's not like oh you didn't use the cab space wisely or anything it's like you just you you got nothing from that pick like you could have at least gotten a player that other teams would have valued you could have traded max domi for a pick if you didn't want him yep I, there was always the way the out of that too i mean yeah yes yeah, so the, the risk was always low and that was certainly not the only pick that they made that was like that but that's that's another another issue yeah but i'm okay with them making the decision on maybe some of those other contracts like you mentioned of not bringing in a bunch of contracts where it's either risky uh, as far as player like health and fit and everything or just you know taking on bad contracts from somebody if they're not willing to meet your price to take on the bad contract don't take on the bad contract like that simple <laughs> like don't just don't do that to yourself as we said it it's just as much of an asset to have that cap space available for if when something becomes available uh you can make a move on it so uh i'm okay with that aspect of them not doing it at the expansion draft but yes some of the picks i think can be questioned for other reasons i just don't know how much the cap space really plays into it mm-hmm but that is a good question. I know it's something that we've had people wondering. Yeah. And be, you know, what's all this cap space for if we're not using it? So that, yeah. that's a good question. It's, it's for the others. future, which is, as everybody else, as everybody has been pointing out in the post games and stuff, we're all starting to look at the future anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's what yep. it's for. Yep. So moving on to coaching, uh, we mm -hmm. have some coaching questions. Uh, this first one from Scott Gilberts. 
It is clear all of us want Dave Haxtall to have a reasonable opportunity to get the ship sailing on a much steadier course. Uh, CYA fan clause for a, but let's assume, uh, for just a minute that Francis sends him packing, which is hard to see him doing to a friend. What kind of coach do you think this team needs and who out there would even be available, let alone interested? It's an attractive job still, but, <laughs> and it close it with geez, my questions suck. Your questions do not suck, Scott. No, it's a good question. And a little more confidence. And we'll, we'll throw that in also, um, with beneath the ponds question on Twitter. If you had the ability to replace Haxtell right now, would you? And if so, what coach to replace him with? So similar thing. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess as far as, I mean, yeah, who's available and, and, and what kind of coach do we want to see? The first couple names that come to mind are all the broadcaster names, right? And we just saw this with Bruce Boudreaux, right? Goes from NHL Network to Vancouver. Apparently that was a genius move from from Vancouver. Um, <laughs> we got the, the first two names that come to mind, obviously, Rick Tockett, who's been doing stuff with TNT, and uh, Tortorella, who's been on Espen. I do not want Tortorella. Tortorella is a lovely man in person. I promise everybody. I've met him a couple times. He's a <laughs> he is a truly good human being. He's very passionate when he is coaching, and that's where maybe issues arise. But but at the same time, I don't think he would be a good fit for this team at all. Um, don't want him to be the coach of the Kraken. And yeah. uh, with Rick Tockett, maybe that works out better. You and I, you know, we talked about him a lot leading up to the coaching hiring over the off season uh, because he was heavily rumored met with them. I think it was three times that yep. there was meetings a there. A third interview. Yeah. A third interview, which is basically unheard of. So, um, you know, looking at what he did in Arizona, I think he could maybe work out because it's a little bit more maybe structured and maybe a little bit more of a player motivator. And that's mm -hmm. what I guess I would say is I want more out of this, you know, Kraken coaching staff, or maybe if there was to be a change, what it, I'd want to see is I want someone who can get the team going. How many games have we started off the post game lives talking about, they just started off slow. They played, they were playing from behind right away, right? All that stuff. Yep. And, and, you know, digging out of extended losing streaks, all of that stuff. I think part of that is just, you know, you got to get guys going. You got to get them to believe in what you're doing. You got to, you know, as much as you got to come up with the system, you got to sell the system and you got to get people to want to get out of bed to be in the system. And I feel like right now that's kind of where the breakdown is. Yeah. I mean, having a motivator is probably, you know, the next logical step. If you decide that a coach like Haxtell isn't what you want for this team, I don't think we're at that point yet to answer the first part of, of, um, you know, of the second question, basically from beneath the pond, you know, I, I think, as uh, was pointed out, we, we do want to give him a chance to succeed. Mm -hmm. But if you were to decide that, you know, that's not going to work out, I think the natural way that this tends to go is you've, you get a developer and then usually you kind of try and go with the guy a little more, the opposite, a little more of a motivator, a little more of a drill sergeant, mm -hmm. you know, someone who's, who's going to get on the players a little bit more. Um, and oftentimes after a few years, when that wears out, you know, you go back to a developer, yeah. someone like Haxtell, someone who's kind of more friendly with the players and that sort of thing. Um, you know, and that's just kind of how it works, you know, message wise. Um, but yeah, I, I agree uh, with you is, you know, that's kind of the profile they look for a coach as far as who's available. Yeah. I don't know that there's a whole lot of guys out there right now that, that have impressive resumes that also kind of fit that, uh, you know, fit that mold. Tortorella is the first name that came to mind as far as on paper, <laughs> who would, but I think you make a good point as if you think that Tortorella is not right for the team yeah. and we know that, that it's not someone we'd want. Cause I know you're a big John Tortorella fan. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that's the fit for this team. No. And it, you know, I think going back to when we were talking about what they, you know, the decisions they made in the off season and around the expansion draft and everything, they hired Dave Axtell knowing he is a development coach. That has been his career track record. That is what he's good at. They were sending the message. That's what they wanted. You, It's fair to maybe criticize that decision and say, well, you're an expansion team going to be full of already developed NHL players. You maybe just need to get the most out of them coming out of the gate. Um, and, and I think that's what we're seeing here is, you know, maybe this doesn't quite line up. The team that you're going to have as an expansion team doesn't quite line up with having a, a, a coach that's more focused on developing people. Um, but to me, that again, that just signals their plan is long term. They're thinking about bringing in guys like Matty Beniers and all of that stuff and what Hackstall is going to be able to do with those types of players. Um, 
I still think everybody thought they'd have more success than they, they have been having. Yep. Um, still a lot of things going around though, you know, like COVID they've been dealing with all year. Like there's been other things uh, that you can point to, but uh, I, I just think, yes, as far as a first year expansion team, you got a bunch of, you know, pre-built NHL players, so to speak, maybe a development coach isn't totally the right fit for that but a year or two down the line it could be totally genius and it's exactly what the kraken needed so we'll see yeah and i think it's certainly too early to you know to write that off you know given especially the guys they have coming in the pipeline mm -hmm. all right so moving from head coach uh to the assistant coach a question from robert wilson how does our assistant coaching staff compare to others around the league in pedigree and experience okay so who do you, who do you want to start with uh, let's I mean, look, on, on a yeah. whole, I guess we could kind of say from a pedigree standpoint, I don't, I don't know how to compare it necessarily to all the other assistant coaching staffs, but you know, not a ton of experience, not a ton of pedigree in that sense. I think that's fair mm -hmm. to say about this group. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, and it's not something that you necessarily need. Mm -hmm. Uh, and certainly when you have one of the guys in Jay Leach, who's, you know, a recent NHL player, you know, when you have mm -hmm. a guy like that on the staff, yeah, he's not going to have this long coaching history. Cause I mean, just recently he was playing NHL hockey games. Yeah. So, uh, that's part of it, but, uh, yeah, let, I mean, let's start with Jay Leach. Okay. I mean, I was going to say in some ways his experience is maybe better, right? He's been an AHL yeah. head coach for several seasons, uh, he's and the successful. fast riser in the coaching ranks for sure. Yeah. And he was successful and, Generally, when we see the fast risers in the, you know NHL circles, there is very good reason for it. Uh, mm -hmm. All the all the people I could think of, Travis Green, I know, obviously just fired. <laughs> That's not a great example. But uh, you go back, you look at Dan Bilesma, guys like that. Um, anytime they just kind of they retire, start coaching, figure out how to coach, boom, their head coach at like an AHL level, and then make the jump to the NHL. Like it's 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 because they're naturals at it usually. Uh, they're good communicating with their players. They're they're good at that stuff, and and so I think Jay Leach, you know, he's at the beginning of his coaching career, as you point out. Um, but I think based on everything we've already seen, you know, chart is moving up. Oh, for sure, for sure. And and, and you want to be the team that'll give a guy like that, you know, the opportunity at the NHL mm -hmm. level. I mean, because if you don't, some other team is going to. And, yeah. You know, once you spend a few years as an assistant on another staff, good luck. You're just not going to be able to get a guy like that. Exactly. So um, that's that's Jay Leach. Not a ton of experience, but what is there is good. Um, I guess Paul, Paul, Paul McFarland. Yeah. You you want to start with him? So yeah. Paul McFarland, again, he's not really any old, you know, he's, he's only 36. Um, so he's kind of another fast riser. Um, and, you know, he getting into the coaching, you know, he was, he was uh, like a head coach in the OHL for the Kingston Frontenacs. You know, only his third season coaching, um, you know, he wasn't an NHL player, but, you know, he's gotten to the coaching ranks and, you know, was an assistant at the NHL level for a few years. So he has some experience there. He's got, you know, kind of the pedigree um, and, uh, you know, kind of was someone who Haxtell knew from the Toronto Maple Leafs, you know, last season. So he got really familiar with him and he's someone that, you know, you want the assistant coaches to be on the same page as the head coach as well. Um, and so someone who has that kind of, you know, whole year of familiarity there with Hackstall, you know, it is good to have around just to make sure the you know, that message is getting out the way that he wants it to. Yeah. And it, interestingly enough, um, you know, head coach, of the Kingston front next, then goes, joins Florida as an assistant coach, the Panthers. All right. There for a couple of years, <laughs> no, nothing great happened there. Uh, and then, Yes, joining the Maple Leafs for a couple season, he he had signed to go back and and coach the Frontenacs, like like that yep. was that was a done deal. He was gonna go back and be the head coach at the OHL level, um, before season gets you know wiped out COVID wise. Like that's a that's a thing, and then obviously comes back now with Seattle. Um, you know I don't know how to read that, right? On on the one hand, you could say like okay, spent you know what four or five you know four ish years up at the nhl level now you're going back down to the ohl level does that mean that you know to take the job you had before the very job yeah well and in normally i would say that's a red flag but in major junior worlds like that is just what happens everybody yeah. leaves and everybody comes right back a couple of years later that's just <laughs> how it goes uh you know 
you see like these longtime coaches they're there for like 20 years they disappear to go somewhere else for like three years they come right back like it's just it's just how it works at the major junior level um but but it was kind of like you had two nhl assistant coaching gigs things don't work out for whatever reason you're going back to the ohl but now this situation comes up again though super young so i don't know how to read that if this is somebody older, I would say like, okay, they had a long, good career at the OHL level, come up to the pros, isn't quite working, go back down to major junior. Like clearly there's that disconnect, right? It's it's no different right. than like the NFL and college coaches, right? There's some coaches that can just do one and they just can't do the other, mm -hmm. you know, because of all the different things at play. Uh, but given how young he is, I don't see why. I, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I don't think that the idea of him you know, on paper was going to go back to the OHL is that big a deal, uh, just given his age and, and the fact that, you know, what we're going to, we're going to say people are washed out at 36. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of players still in, you know, have their playing career going at that time. Yeah. And also, you know, the fact that, um, you know, that he was still willing to take an NHL assistant role. You'd think if that mm -hmm. was the case that he's like, all right, NHL thing, not for me, I'm going to go back to yeah. junior then you'd think he wouldn't have been able, he wouldn't have been willing to take this role with the Kraken. So, mm -hmm. which is basically a lateral move from assistant coach with the, with the Leafs. Yeah. So there's, there was clearly hunger and desire there. There was obviously a want to, to work with Hackstall. <laughs> and I think that's important. Oh, yeah. So, and, and, you know, it's, it's hard to say without being behind the scenes, as far as, you know, who's working well, who's not working well, all that kind of oh, yeah. stuff. Like we can't even begin to talk about that stuff. So really that's just, you know, talking about where they've come from. <laughs> yep. All right. So closing out the mailbag, uh, we have two questions uh, from Joshua Farnkopf. Uh One, uh, there has been talk about Matty Beneers playing for the Kraken after the college season. I get it would be good for the team to get him in and maybe an end of year boost. But what about the player? <laughs> Getting some experience at the next level would be beneficial, but what are y'all's thoughts on just saving him for next year? Additional development and providing him with a true rookie season next year. So I think we've kind of talked about this in some of the post games and, you know, with Beneers. Uh, and, you know, there's also the issue of burning a year of his entry-level contract as well uh, to take into account. But I think we're both in agreement, right? We think it would be beneficial for Beneers to get some reps at the NHL level and kind of come in and join the team as soon as the season with Michigan's over. Yeah. A thousand percent. Uh, you want to get him in there. You want to get him used to the speed of the game, uh, the physicality of the game, like just used to things in general, used to being in an NHL locker room, used to the day to day of what that life entails. So you're not walking in cold turkey as a rookie the next season. You have something to base you know your life on really right like it's yeah. it's I, I think that is very beneficial the the off ice stuff is just as important as the on ice stuff as far as just seeing the game like i said getting used to the speed of it all i don't think burning the year the contract is that big a deal uh just because you know okay you, you got to pay him after two seasons after that instead of three but very few guys get paid coming right out of that rookie deal. The ones that do are the guys that blow up into like superstars. And, and we take that. Exactly. <laughs> I take that every day of the week. If he's turning out to be like the superstar center, you know, top five or 10 guy yeah. in the league, psh, go for it. Then you pay him like it. You build your team around him and we're all happy. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, so, yeah, yeah, I think you, I think you bring him in as soon as you can. Yep. And then last question, uh, 30 games in now, what are your thoughts on the Kraken versus other expansion teams over the years? I think we all know Vegas was an absolute anomaly, but are the Kraken as bad as some of the others over the years? All right. So I talked a little bit about this. I think it was during the last post game live that we did. And I talked about how, you know, yes, they've been disappointing. And yes, you know, as much as every, all of us were saying, can't can't use vegas as the barometer it was an outlier you can't but it, you, at the same time right like there's always a part of you that's like well come on like that's that's gonna happen <laughs> for us too right like come on it's gonna happen and the bottom line is they were an outlier it wasn't necessarily gonna happen again as we even said earlier today on this podcast did not think they were gonna be this bad um but the thing that the the takeaway and what i was trying to get across was the difference between this team and some of those previous expansion teams before the like revamped rules 
is that with the Seattle Kraken, you know that on paper your team can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with just about anybody in the NHL, and walking into every game at Climate Pledge Arena or watching every game on TV, you have the ability to think that a win can happen. And that did not exist for a lot of previous expansion teams. No. You knew your team was just going to get slaughtered more often than not. Um, looking back at some expansion teams, San Jose Sharks won 17 games their first season. Okay, the Ottawa Senators <laughs> won 10 games. It went 10-70-4. <laughs> like, we don't want that, and this team is Out of isn't 84, that. not just 82. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, it's, you know what I mean? Like, this team is not that bad. The Atlanta Thrashers won 14 games, right? This, I would take this experience over that every day of the week. Look, it's, you know, team's not as competitive as we would have liked, for sure. That is disappointing, but... If it means that, you know, like I said, we can go into every game hoping. You never know when you shell out the money to go to Climate Pledge. You could totally see a crack and win. And and at, regardless, you know you're going to at least see a competitive game, usually. And, yep. and I think that's really important. And uh, if we have to walk away with a top prospect, you know, after this year, just because, <laughs> you know, things went a little sideways. I mean, there are worse consolation prizes, that's for sure. Oh, for sure. Um, and yeah, I think you've said it really well. It's just kind of a whole different level of competitive <laughs> imbalance. Uh, when you look at some of these, especially these 90s expansion teams where you're drafting guys who, you know, could not just, you know, weren't in the top six, but could barely make the roster out yeah. of these teams and, you know, having to have them play some of them play first line minutes. I mean, just a whole nother level. And yeah, the Kraken have a chance to win every single game on paper. And we've seen them beat some of the top mm -hmm. teams in the entire NHL. These 90s expansion teams just couldn't do that. No, you know, they may have got their 10 wins, but I, you know, I haven't gone look back in every one, but I, I bet you they weren't, you know, beating three of the league's best teams in a row. Uh, mm -hmm. it, that just wasn't happening for them. Uh, so yes, they, they are better. Uh, and, uh, yeah, Vegas is an anomaly, but they're, they're cracking firmly better than some of those others. Yeah. All right. So is that it? Yep, that's it for the mailbag. Thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Uh, you know, we again love to read them, love to go through them, and especially you know during the holidays and everything. I'm sure you all you know were busy having your mm -hmm. your Christmas celebrations. Really appreciate you taking the time to send in questions uh, for the mailbag. And uh, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, and you know, gosh, I hope we could get back to cracking hockey soon. Yes, please. <laughs> yes. Yeah games to talk about we've been so spoiled haven't we i know, you know doing this for months and all this you know before the team but uh yeah i, I need some crack at hockey back soon I'm, I'm going a little crazy yes and i'm sure everybody listening or watching uh totally agrees with that but that is going to do it for this episode of the emerald city hockey podcast thanks everybody for listening and we will see you all next time